the, the law of Moses, it had to have changed in a way. No. Because of the because of the destruction of the temple and the and the and the destruction of the sacrificial system, therefore the, it had to change into something that we could actually adhere to today. I'm hanging out here with my with my Jewish brother Yoshua, and we actually just met here. He's you're from where? I'm from New York, the five York? towns. Sweet. Yeah. I'm from California, so both of us grew up Jewish, and we just got into this conversation. He saw the video I did here in Jerusalem, and uh, I'll put the link up there in case you're wondering what that video is. It might be over there somewhere, but. Um, so there's a, there's a religious Jew, a Jew that adheres to the, what were you saying, the Law of Moses? Yes, sir. Okay, the Law of Moses, and a Messianic Jew. And this guy was really kind and sweet, and he wants to have a conversation about the two different philosophies. So you were saying about my faith, as long as... Yeah, so I was saying, so long as you're adhering to religious values, I do believe that that's conducive to leading um, a virtuous lifestyle. Um, but as I said, there's a second perspective, which is, yes, that does run contrary to what I believe in. But at the same time, you know, it, I believe that there's an extent of teach their own. And I think so long as you believe in the deity and you're adhering to those values, yes, I think that's conducive to living a quality and virtuous lifestyle. So, you know, I, I don't necessarily see much of a problem in it if someone else is doing it. Yeah. But then again, I have my own way of conducting my own life. Right, right. So, mm -hmm. so my question would be, so like for the... For instance, in terms of getting into God's good graces or getting into heaven, you know, how, how do we go about doing that? So there's somebody by the name of the Ramchal. Um, he was a prolific Jewish author in the 1700s. Uh, and he espoused this notion that if you want to you know, get into the realm of heaven, you have to establish something called devakus with God. Okay. Um, and in essence, what devakus means is that you're essentially detaching yourself from the physicality of this world and you're clinging, that's exactly what the word means, onto God, into God's ways, onto God's ways rather. Um, and that in essence is how you obtain you know, the ability to get into heaven. Okay. But that being said, from the Jewish perspective, yeah, one does have to believe, as the Rambam puts it, in the 13 principles of faith. And it's mentioned that God is completely one and unique. Uh, and he doesn't have multiple parts. He doesn't have any partners. He is the one that created, creates, and will create. So, you know, yeah. that being said, I believe that that is the means of doing so. Right. Uh, especially for a Jew. But then there are the seven, you know, Noahide laws, right. which are for the Gentiles. Right. Um, and that's how they get into heaven as well. Um, Can I comment on that? Sure, oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Before that, um, so for instance, let's say I'm not an adherent, adherent Jew. Mm -hmm. Say I don't follow the halakha? Yes. Okay. So let's say I'm, I'm dying right now. Mm -hmm. And I don't have time to study. I don't have time to do the 13 principles. I don't have time to go to yeshiva. How mm -hmm. do I get right with God? So I mean, then again, I think we live in a certain generation where we've more or less you know, become estranged from those religious values. And I think if you hold on to at least some of them and you're doing it, the shame shamayim for the sake of God, I do think that at the end of the day, you will still be in good graces with him. I think that, you know, in the nicest way possible, I do think there's a little bit of, you know, misguidance in terms of mess messianic Jews. But I think so long as you're staying true to those values and you're doing it for him, because at the end of the day, you're doing it for God. Right. You're not doing it for any other reason. I don't believe that you're doing it for your ego. I think you're doing it for God. And I think so long as that's the case, I think you're in his good graces. And I think so long as you live a good lifestyle, I think he will uh, judge you accordingly. So Yeah, so, so basically getting into God's good graces it has to do with your own work. Yes. As a, as a, as a human being. Yes. And not on grace. Yes, I, the grace I, of God. Well, because from my opinion, my, from, from from what I see, is that religious religious Jews mm -hmm. live on the law, and under the law, yet practice grace, because what uh, 70 A.D. the te Second Temple was destroyed, and so the whole sacrificial system, the whole system where the law of Moses was created and and and, uh, and attached to, is gone. Mm -hmm. And so if there's 613 laws. And I would say the majority of those laws were attached to the, to the sacrificial system. How do you or we or as religious Jews still adhere to the law of Moses? Hold on. What do you mean by the sacrificial system? Okay, the sacrificial includes the temple, the high priests, and no, the... No, I know what the sacrificial yeah. system is. I'm saying, do you mind elaborating on why those laws were connected to the sacrificial system in terms of the temple and sacrifices within the temple? Um, yeah, so basically the book of Leviticus talks about all the laws that were necessary to be... To, for, to have atonement. Now the sin, the people couldn't actually atone for themselves. The high yes. priest was necessary to do the atonement. He had to be atoned for his, his, his own sin. He had to go into the temple, he had to sacrifice for his own sin, and they had to sacrifice for the sin of the people. So the people couldn't actually atone for their own sin. And when did that actually change to where we can now atone for our own sins? 
by, say, repentance or good deeds? Well, I mean, you know, there is the idea of tefillah, which is, in essence, emulating what the korban, uh, what the korbanim, the sacrifices, were essentially doing. In fact, at the beginning of the tefillah, we, we discuss the korbanim, there's this part called korbanot, and we go into depth about what those korbanim were. And in essence, yeah, we're attempting to emulate what those korbanim were um, through, our, through our prayer. Right. Um, so I wouldn't say that that would um, signify that those old ways, old ways supposedly are antiquated. I would say that they're still with us. Uh, we just don't have the temple, right. meaning we don't have the ability to actually conduct the sacrifices anymore. Right. But that doesn't mean that we're not still attached to them in a sense because we still emulate them through our prayer. And I mean, there's the, ne the necessity of the oral Torah. Uh, the Torah leaves many of the, I mean, the whole, most of our laws were instituted by the oral Torah. Yeah. You take something from the written Torah, and they have to then actually apply that. They have to make that something that's actually palpable. Like, for example, right. you know how Jews put on something like tefillin? Yeah. So what does totafot ben mean? That's yeah. what it says. It says totafot ben means right. in between your eyes. We put it up here. Right. Why is that? Because we need the oral Torah, the, the, the uh, sages, to actually elucidate what that means. So I'm saying they instituted the prayer, and in essence, we are emulating the korbanot. Right. So it's still in part and parcel to our practice. Right. So, if, if, so it's all according to the oral law. Yes. Meaning, the, the law of Moses, it had to have changed in a way. No. Because of the, because of the destruction of the temple and the, and, the, and the destruction of the sacrificial system, therefore the, it had to change into something that we could actually adhere to today. So there's the idea of minhagim. Basically, we have to take the laws that the Torah establishes, and then we have, yeah, we have to apply them to our circumstances yeah. in a sense. That's why Jews have different practices in a sense. But it all comes from the... Torah from Moses. Yeah. Just we have to apply to the circumstances in which we live. Like for example, um, in what's it called? In New York, for example, I wait six hours in between meat and milk, right? But in the Netherlands, they wait one hour. Because the thing is, there's a totally different set of circumstances, like in terms of how long the sun's out and whatnot. So I mean, yeah, you have to apply the halakha to, work, to your certain circumstances yeah. in which you're living. Yeah. But then again, that's not to say that that's not what the uh, law of Moses intended for, and it's not to say that it's necessarily been changed. There are right. certain parts that we do have to apply to our own circumstances. So there's adaptations regarding... In fact, the 12 the tribes did that. There was a minhag for each of the tribes. Which is fascinating. I've actually learned about this recently. Yeah. Um, there's only so much that I know about uh, the religion at this point. You know, I'm in yeshiva for the year. I'm trying to That's learn great. as much as I can. And, and I appreciate. And I, you know what I admire is the discipline and the desire to be close to God and to learn. Absolutely, it's incredible. That's what it's all about. And I appreciate this conversation a lot. Sure. I have a question about the oral Torah. Absolutely. Okay. So the, my my question is, since there's no, you, you, we might think it's different, but I I didn't find any evidence of the oral Torah in the Tanakh. Well, I mean. For and, and so, no, the, oh, sorry, the, sorry. no, the question is, the, the first records of the Oral Torah are centuries after the New Testament. The first records of the actual Oral Torah. And so basically, it's, the, the Oral Torah comes much, centuries after you know, Yeshua, centuries after the, 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 the New Testament, but yet is placed in front of it, meaning in, in terms of timeline, that it actually came back when Moses was on Mount Sinai with, with, with God. But yet there's no an actual record of that until, I would have to say, at least 500 years after the New Testament. Uh, do you mind elaborating? I'm, uh... No, I'm just saying that the, 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 written, the, the written oral Torah okay. appeared centuries after. Are you talking about the Gemara and the Mishnah yes. and things of that nature? So, I mean, yes, the oral Torah was not meant to be written down. That was not, right. but at the same time, because, you know, the world was rapidly changing and the tradition was beginning to degrade, yeah. Rav Yehuda Anasi needed to, he decided that we're going to compile it uh, and we're going to actually have it written down because right. the truth is used to be, okay, it's a Masora, which means a uh, transmission mm -hmm. from your Rav to the student, right. father to son, and so on and so forth. Yeah. But the thing is, considering you know the rigorous nature of day-to-day -day life, yes, they needed to write it down. Very, very controversial decision, but at the same time, it, w it needed to be done. And yes, it doesn't necessarily say in the um, written Torah that that was meant to be what happened because, yeah, it says the oral Torah is meant to stay oral. Right. But at the same time, the Rebbeim came together and they decided this is what needs to happen in order for the tradition to continue, yeah. and so it has. Yeah, I was reading the, the Tanakh, and I, and I came across a part um, that the, the people had a very difficult time even keeping the written Torah because they were in exile and they were uh, in, uh, in a disobedience to God, and so God was punishing the people and sending them into exile, and they had a very difficult time even keeping the written Torah, let alone an oral Torah. And so the thought of it actually being able to transmit from generation to generation after all the the things that the, the, the disobedience to God, the exile that the Jewish people went through, to be able to actually 
uh, uh, hold on to an oral Torah would be almost impossible. What do you say about that? I actually agree. I think that's, what, that's why the Rebbeim came together and decided they needed to compile the oral Torah. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, the oral Torah is the exact oral Torah that we've always had. It's just now it's been compiled. Yeah. Uh, and it's written down as opposed to remaining oral. Because the truth is, yeah, considering, I, I mean, just take a look at how Jews live now. I mean, we all, for the most part, most of us are living what's called modern orthodox lives. Yeah. I think it's only 13% of us that are religious these days. And the thing is, yeah, it literally would have been lost to the history books. And I mean, that's the importance of tradition. It's something that needs to be preserved. Tradition's not, you know, the worship of ashes, but it's the preservation of a fire nice. and I mean that's in essence what we did and I'm saying the lifestyles that we all live now are part of, it's all to do with the fact that they decided that they're going to compile it and keep it going yeah. the truth is, yeah we probably would have lost it otherwise but then again I, I could be uh, wrong about some of the details yeah but then so again, what, what do you think about Jesus what do I think about Jesus Yeshua so yes yeah, so I do I'll ask you this just to preface sure. what do you think about the Old Testament uh, the Tanakh yes no, it's the Word of God. Okay, it's the Word of God. I think God. it's the Word of God, and I believe that the Old Testament, there was prophecies throughout the Old Testament that talked about a coming one, mm -hmm. a, a Messiah. Yes. Okay, and I believe that even through Isaiah 53, have you read Isaiah 53? Yes, I have. 52, uh, 13 through 53, 12, talks about someone very specific. You have the suffering servant. Suffering servant that would die for the, uh, that would suffer for the people, and through his, uh, um, uh, through his punishment, we are healed. And so, some religious Jews would say that that was the, the, the nation of Israel. Rashi would say that that's the, uh, the nation of Israel. Yes, so I'll elaborate on that in a second, but I'll yeah. answer your first question pertaining to what do I think about Jesus. Yeah. So considering we agree uh, that the Old Testament is the Word of God, yes. there were messianic predictions made in the Old Testament. They laid it out what would happen before the Messiah came. For example, you have Chiat Metim, you have the end of all wars, universal adherence and knowledge of God and to his principles, mm -hmm. the ingathering of the exiles, if you know Sancher have split up the, uh, all the tribes. So the ingathering of the exiles, uh, the rebuilding of the temple, the end of all wars, and universal adherence to God and right. his principles. So what happened in the times of Christ? Um, not only did none of that happen, but the exact opposite happened. The Jews were exiled even further as opposed to an ingathering of the exiles. You didn't have universal adherence to God and his principles. In fact, the Romans only further disrupted that process. Um, you didn't have the resurrection of the dead. In fact, around a million Jews died as, at the hands of the Romans. I mean, you just go through all these messianic predictions that were made in the Old Testament that right. you and I agree to be true. Um, none of them came to fruition. So I'm saying just based on that, I can't hold that Jesus is the Messiah considering right. I believe in the Old Testament. Okay, so a strong... Uh, a, well, no, I'm going to have to get going soon because no, I don't no. have class soon, but yeah. It's yeah. awesome. A response to that would be is, is how, many, um, how many times is the Messiah supposed to come? How many times is the Messiah supposed to come? So first off, there's Mashiach ben Yosef mm -hmm. and Mashiach ben David. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, as the Rambam brings down in the Mishnah Torah, the actual Messiah is not supposed to die and Jesus did in fact die. And I mean, I know the Christian argument that, um, you know, later on, yes, it's, it's going to happen the next time, the second coming, that's when those predictions mm -hmm. are going to take place. But I'm saying, if Jesus is to be the Messiah, and, and the, the notion is, the Jews rejected the Messiah, that's why God rejected them. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, if those predictions didn't happen, I mean, how were we supposed to accept them? If it's going to happen thousands of years later, yeah. I would say it's somewhat preposterous to assume that we should have accepted him then, because wow. we didn't have the actual evidence to accept him as the Messiah. Right. And I mean, if you've seen, there's the whole example of Shabtai Tzvi, where the Jews did accept a false prophet, and you saw what happened to us then, he converted to Islam, and I mean, the trials and tribulations that we went through as a result of that. So I mean, one has to be meticulous about figuring out who the Messiah actually is. And I'm saying when the evidence was not present, how could we have been the people to accept the Messiah? Right, so there were many prophecies that he did fulfill. Many prophecies that he did fulfill. Did suffer for the people. He did die for the atonement for the sins. He did rise from the dead. Uh, he was born in, in, in Bethlehem. He came before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD as prophesied in Daniel 9. Um, so there were a lot, of, a lot of prophecies that he did fulfill. The thing that the, that, the, that the Tanakh doesn't say is how many times he would come and when he would come, except for the first installment, basically. We believe that there's a second coming, coming, and you know that. You know, that, that, that that's our belief as, as Christians yes. or Messianic Jews. And so we believe that, that the prophecies that needed to be fulfilled at that time were fulfilled and that he did what he needed to do to reconnect us with God, find peace and, sh and shalom betzem, with the Father. And then in the second installment, then all the rest will be fulfilled. Listen, I, this is I know great. you have to go. Yeah, I've, I've, I appreciate you. Yes. And I just wanted to say really quickly that we have a, a religious Jew here 
and a Messianic Jew. What would you call yourself, an Orthodox Jew? I would call myself an Orthodox, Orthodox Jew, yeah. And we're brothers, we're Jewish brothers, mm -hmm. and we can have an intellectual conversation. You're very smart, by the way. Thank you. And I appreciate your time. And uh, we can have these discussions and not get angry with each other and hate each other Absolutely. and throw rocks at each other. It's all about peace and love. God bless you. At the end of the day. All God right, bless man. you. Take, right, care. take care. Thank you for your time.